This is a 6V6 GT receiving tube. It was manufactured by Radio Corporation of America, aka RCA, in August of 1964. The 6V6 is one of the most popular tubes of all time. In the guitar amp world, it's one of the big four Alpha tubes. The other three, of course, being the EL34, the 6BQ5, and the 6L6. Pretty much every Fender amp under 40 watts is powered by a 6V6. That includes famous designs like the 5E3 Deluxe, the Princeton, and the Deluxe Reverb. You can also find 6V6s in modern boutique amps like Benson's, Jim Kelly's, Milkman, Mesa Boogie, Sir, and many others. This is a 6AQ5 receiving tube, or in this case the ruggedized version 6005W. It was manufactured by General Electric in 1982, 22nd week. In guitar amp design, the 6AQ5 is a very unpopular tube, especially compared to a tube like the 6V6. There have been a handful of popular amps over the years with 6AQ5s, most notably probably the Gibson Skylark, but chances are you've never heard of this tube, You've certainly never seen any amp utilizing this tube at a big box store like Guitar Center or Sam Ash. Definitely never seen replacement 6AQ5s on the shelves of those stores. This is a bit surprising, of course, because as far as electricity is concerned, these two tubes are essentially the same. All right, so I will admit that intro was a little dramatic, and I'm sure there's somebody already furiously typing in the comments that, of course, they've heard of the 6AQ5. It's literally their favorite tube amp ever. They are currently surrounded by boxes and boxes of 6AQ5, of which they grab a handful every other week and build a tube amp. I'm sure that's the case, and I will not deny that the 6AQ5 does have a, a small following in the DIY tube amp world, but I'm not wrong when I say that it hasn't been popular at all in guitar amps. And if you go and try to buy a tube amp right now, new manufacturer, there is an exceptionally low likelihood that it's going to have six AQ5 tubes. If you're going to find one, it's probably gonna be a one-off build from a very small batch tube amp manufacturer. If you ask a thousand guitar players what their favorite Alpha tube is, approximately zero of them will say six AQ5. But perhaps that shouldn't be the case. I have here the data sheets for the two tubes, six AQ5 on the left, six V6 GT on the right. The 6V6 is a beam power pentode designed for use in the audio frequency power output stage of television and radio receivers. The 6AQ5 is a miniature beam power pentode designed for use in the audio frequency power output stage of television and radio receivers. How about maximum ratings? The 6V6 has a maximum plate dissipation of 12 watts, a maximum plate voltage, DC voltage, of 315 volts. The 6AQ5, maximum plate dissipation, 12 watts. DC plate voltage, eh, 250 volts. Okay, that's different, fair. Let's look at some operating characteristics. On the right here, 6V6 and a Class AB push-pull amplifier. At 250 volts on the plate, you can expect a zero signal plate current of 70 milliamps, a zero signal screens current of 5 milliamps, an effective load resistance of 10,000 ohms. 6AQ5, push-pull, Class AB amplifier, plate voltage 250 volts, zero signal plate current 70 milliamps, zero signal screen current 5 milliamps, load resistance 10,000 ohms. So how do these two tubes differ? Obviously they're in a different package. The 6V6 is significantly larger. By the way, eagle-eyed viewers will notice that this is in fact a 5V6. I don't know how it's possible, but somehow in my tube stash, I actually don't have a 6V6. 5V6 and 6V6 are the same tube. 5V6 is just powered by five volt heater voltage instead of six volt. But for today, this is our 6V6. But yes, they're in a different package. The 6V6 has a standard octal base. The 6AQ5 uses a seven pin miniature base. As we saw in the data sheets, the 6V6 can handle 315 volts on the plate. The 6AQ5 can only handle 250 volts on a plate. For the 6005W version, I've seen some data sheets quote 275 volts. For DIY builders, another big difference is going to be availability. The popularity of 6V6 tubes has manifested itself well in the markets for new old stock and vintage tubes. Right now, if you go on eBay, you'll find an average price for used but good testing 6V6 vintage tubes anywhere from $20 to $60, depending on the make and model or the specific version. If you want new old stock 6V6 tubes, especially the big manufacturers like General Electric, RCA, Sylvania, Hytron, you're gonna be paying significantly more, up to $200 sometimes for new old stock. In comparison, the 6AQ5, or even the ruggedized version, the 6005 or 6005W, will regularly be had on eBay for under $10. New old stock, not used, brand new, for less than $10. So you have two tubes that are electrically essentially the same. Yes, the 6AQ5 has slightly lower plate voltages, but let's be honest, we abuse those plate voltage maximum ratings in most tube amps regardless, even over the 315 for 6V6s. They have the same plate dissipation, they have the same low resistance, so you can use most likely the same output transformer. So why? Why is it the case that most major tube amp manufacturers right now are not using 6AQ5s? 
The answer, I believe, is pretty simple. It's because neither JJ or Sovtech make 6AQ5s, and Belton doesn't make 7-pin sockets. If you want to get sockets for the 6AQ5, you're probably hunting on eBay for 7-pin sockets. They're available, they can be had, but supplies are limited and sporadic. Whereas the 6V6 is manufactured by, as far as I know, every tube amp current in-production tube amp manufacturers. JJ, Sovtech, the two Chinese plants are all making 6V6. Belton absolutely makes octal sockets. So from a logistics standpoint, if you're gonna design a tube amp, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have access to the parts to build that amp for the foreseeable future. The 6AQ5, while the parts and the tubes are available right now, their availability in any type of quantity is going to be temperamental at best. Whereas the 6V6 is much more established, much more steady from a design logistics standpoint, getting parts in. It's just too risky to do any type of serious production run based on 6AQ5 tubes. The good news, of course, then, is for DIY builders like us, that means that there are decent quantities out there that aren't being picked apart by the larger manufacturers, and we can still get good tubes at good prices and be able to build with them. This is why the 6AQ5 or 6005 is one of my favorite output tubes. I'm going to show you one of the amps that I've built with 6AQ5. It's, it's one of my favorite amps I've ever built, and then we'll have a listen to it. And I hope uh, this video, if nothing else, it inspires you to perhaps go and grab a couple 6005s or 6AQ5s, whatever, of your own, and do some experimenting with it. I don't think you will be disappointed. So here's the 6AQ5 amp that I built. It uses two 12AX7 tubes. In this case, I happen to have a Muller 12AX7 in here and a, oh yeah, it's a Toshiba 12AX7. It is using a 6CA4 rectifier tube, and then of course the 6005, 6AQ5 output tubes. The transformers are all Hammond. This is a 270DAX power transformer, a 194A4 Henry Choke, and a 1760E output transformer. For controls, we have volume, bass, treble, and master. The volume is a simple potentiometer to ground after the first gain stage. Bass and treble is a standard Fender tone stack with a fixed mid control. If you push in on the bass pot, you lift the tone control out of circuit. It's essentially like a boost. The master control is pre-phase inverter. We'll look at the schematic in a second. There's also a bright switch that brings in or disconnects the cap around the volume control. Works just like a standard Fender bright switch. Input jack, of course. Neon lamp for indication. On-off switch. No standby switch because it is a tube rectified amp. Tube rectified amps do not need a standby switch. In truth, most amps, tube amps, don't need a standby switch. If you do, there's probably a better way to do whatever you're trying to do, um, but we can talk about standby switches some other time. On the back, it's even simpler. We have our output jack to the speakers. We have a three-way selection for output impedance for 8 and 16 ohm. There's a fuse holder, two amps, low below, recommended, and the AC inlet for power. It's a relatively simple amplifier. It's built in one of the Hammond pre-made chassis, which was a relatively new thing when I built this, um, but I like it a lot. It was right off the shelf, ready-made. It's nice and deep, so there's plenty of room to work. And like I said before, it's one of the best sounding amps I think I've ever made. And it features the 6AQ5. Let's crack it open and have a look inside and we'll also look at the schematic. Here is the schematic for the amp. I actually just had to draw it up. I thought I had it written down somewhere, but I guess not. So we have a pretty standard input stage here. 100K plate resistor, 1.5K cathode resistor with a 22 microfarad bypass cap, 68K input resistor. This would be coming off the input jack, of course. 22 nanofarad output cap going to the volume control, which is probably a audio one meg. I can't see the rating, but it's probably what it is. And here's the bright cap, 180 picofarad that is defeatable with that switch. 220K resistor going into the next stage. The first half of making up this cathode follower circuit. 1K cathode resistor, one microfarad bypass around that with 100K plate resistor. And then it's DC coupled to the next stage which has a 56K cathode resistor, and of course the plate connected directly up to the same power node for the previous two stages. The cathode follower here is able to drive a good amount of current through the tone stack, which is that Fender tone stack I mentioned. Trouble control up here is probably a 250K, base control probably a one meg, and here is that fixed resistor, which I actually didn't write down the value for. Should be a 6.8K. I don't think I deviated significantly from the Fender value, so we'll just assume that's a 6.8K. And then this switch is the push pole for the base pot, pushing in that switch and just breaks this connection, bringing the whole tone stack out of circuit. So the audio just follows the path through the cap, through the drop control onto the next stage. 22 nanofarad output cap from the tone stack into the master control. That's part of the phase inverter here. So phase inverter has 100K plate resistor, 100K cathode resistor with a small intermediate 1.5K resistor. And then the master, which is also an audio one meg, is connected here to the junction. And then you have your two phase output from the cathodine phase inverter. 
one from the plate, one from the cathode, and those will be 180 degrees out of phase. By the way, side note, I believe I was calling this a power phase inverter on the video I did last week for the Newcomb. That was a mistake. It's a cathodyne or concertina is another name for this type of phase inverter. Power phase is a different type of phase inverter where you tap off from the signal from your first triode and bring that back down to the stage and then tap off from the plate on that as well. The cathodyne here was a later design that just takes advantage of the in phase and out of phase signal available from a triode stage like this. Following along to the power amp, here's our X and Y coming from the phase inverter. That's going into the two 6AQ5 pentodes. There are 220K grid leak resistors coming off the grid connections for those two alpha tubes. They are individually biased with 470K cathode resistors and bypassed with 47 microfarad caps. The screens are protected with 1K 5 watt resistors. The plates of course are connected to the output transformer, the Hammond 1760E that has its three output taps. And then the power supply is pretty standard down here. We have our incoming voltage from the wall that's fused with that two amp slow blow, double pull, double throw switch to turn on the amp. Hammond 270 DAX power transformer. Two taps on that, the high voltage tap has its own independent fuses. Diode protection for the 6CA4, so just in case this tube dies, the diodes will still continue to rectify. The six volt heater winding down here has all the heaters for the rectifier. The two 6AQ5 output tubes, the 12AX7 tubes, it also has balancing resistors, 100 ohm resistors that are connected to J, which is actually the cathode of one of the 6AQ5s. That gives a DC elevation point to the heaters, which can help reduce hum. And then the power supply here just has a 33 microfarad reservoir cap that feeds up to the output transformer for the plates of the output tubes. 194A for Henry Hammond choke, filter caps for the remaining power stages with 10K dropping resistors in between and those connect to different points. C is the screens, B is the phase inverter, and A is the cathode follower and the input gain stage. Pretty simple tube amp, nothing really revolutionary in here. It's a combination of known building blocks that just sound great, work great, and the consequence is a good sounding amp. So here's the inside of the amp. These black and white wires flying up here are the heater winding, filter caps tucked in at various positions, here are the two 100 ohm balancing resistors, and you can see that green wire is coming over here to the cathode on this 6AQ5. Tone stack stuck up in here. You can see that push-pull pot sticking out right there with the two switch contacts. Side note, if you're building like this, don't stick a filter capacitor back in there. That's not a good idea. Put this out somewhere much more accessible. Filter caps are wear items inside tube amps and will need to be replaced, and replacing that one is gonna suck. You can see the independent bias resistors here for the 6AQ5, 470 ohm, five watt resistors, screen resistors, bypass caps, pretty standard stuff, nothing crazy. I think now we should flip this sucker over, plug it in and have a listen. 